Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Sydney Superdome for this last uh, game day um, at the FIBA Women's Basketball World Cup 2022. It has been an amazing 10 days of close games, uh, great fans and atmosphere in the venues, both here and at Sports Center. Uh, before we leave uh, Central Stage to basketball, we are here joined by two, uh, I imagine, happy top representatives, uh, Chair of the Women's Basketball World Cup Local Organizing Committee, Mr. David Reed, and FIBA Secretary General, Mr. Andreas Zaglis. Um, Andreas, we'll leave the floor to you first for some opening remarks, followed by David, and we will then open the floor uh, to questions from the audience here. We also have some media um, connected remotely. We'll take first uh, questions in from the room. Andreas? Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, it's, uh, it's very difficult not to be happy uh, today. I think uh, these have been uh, 10 uh, fantastic game, fantastic uh, days for uh, women's uh, basketball. Um, I would like to, to start by, by thanking uh, the local organizing committee, its chair and, and fellow member of the central board, David Reed, the CEO of the LOC, Melissa King, um, of course, the deputy chairs, our honorary president, Mr. Elfison and, and, and Bronin Marshall. A fantastic LOC team. I would like to thank the, the volunteers, the many volunteers that have uh, given uh, a real push to, to the event, and they have been fundamental in the delivery. Our gratitude to the uh, government of New South Wales, our federation, Basketball Australia and Basketball New South Wales, and of course the federal government that all will be represented today in, in the finals day, a finals day that is the climax of uh, a tournament that saw the 12 best in the world competing for a brand new uh, Women's World Cup trophy. I think FIBA is extremely pleased with the delivery of the event as well as with the worldwide impact of the event. And I can say this has been since the beginning a central piece of a beautiful puzzle we are creating, especially since we put in 2019 women in basketball at the center of FIBA's global strategy. Um, it has not been easy for the organizers. I remind you that the hosting of the event was decided by FIBA at the time of its first ever online meeting because of COVID in, in March 2020, two and a half years ago, a short period to prepare such an event. And during this period, um, most of the time, or a large period of that time, the borders were closed. And uh, the teams, however, worked in a seamless way. I think this was, uh, per my team, one of the best collaborations they've, they've had uh, with, with the local organizing committee. Now, of course, um, we are before uh, the bronze medal game and the final game, but we still have quite some numbers to be proud of, and I would like to share some of them with you. First, on, on the court, I believe the level of the championship uh, has shown to us that the decision to increase from 2026 to 16 teams and to introduce uh, a new competition that will be played in the same year with the World Cup so that we have 32 overall playing at the world level in the year of, of World Cup is, is the correct one. We were very happy to see teams that were struggling to be as competitive as they would have liked in the past to, to really uh, perform at the high level, show that uh, the women's game is, is open to everyone. The women's game is um, indeed possible for a country to make it to the top following the pathway. I would also like to say that this is the first World Cup of uh, FIBA that followed the new competition format. We had dedicated um, qualifiers last February. We had excellent Continental Cups last year that were the first step of the road to Sydney. So here in Sydney, um, and speaking of our women in in basketball strategy, um, we've had a uh, big increase compared to 2014 and 2018 on the female coaches. Five of the 12 head coaches were, were women. Um, first time in history, more than 50% of the officials, of the referees, 
uh, were women, and not because this was a deliberate attempt to do that. It was because they were the best. And um, I would also like to say that in terms of attendance, the promotion of the event, the connection with the local communities that very deliberately the LOC tried from the beginning. Um, I, I, I find it hard to remember any other event where we had so many um, official representatives, diplomats of countries and big communities coming with them or coordinated by them, embassies and consulates. And I think that gave a special feeling to many of, of the games. Uh, it is not an accident that until yesterday the highest attended game was not a game of Australia. And um, that was a USA-China game in, in the group phase. Overall, um, up to now we have more than doubled the total number of attendance from Spain although we have four fewer games, four games less. Um, we are looking at a number which is close to 130,000 uh, spectators in the venues. Of course, an excellent facility here, as well as a very nice boutique, I would say, uh, uh, facility in, uh, in the sports center, recently renovated. Um, we have an average of all the games, approximately 3,400 uh, spectators. And I think I can speak with uh, one voice, but uh, on behalf of both of us, we're extremely happy to have a sold out finals day um, with the bronze medal game and the final game to be attended by uh, approximately 16,000 fans of women's basketball. Um, one element that I would like also to identify as a strong indicator of improvement is the total uh, points average per game. We have uh, 13 points more in average compared to uh, 2014, from 132 to 145. This means that uh, many of the games in average are decided above the 70 point mark which means also higher accuracy for our athletes and also more uh, exciting games for our fans. And this is not because of the big win and the record uh, mark in the USA-Korea game. We, we did the math. It had an impact, but not as much. I would uh, conclude, therefore, that um, we have uh, seen here by, by all metrics a tremendous effort um, by the hosts. Um, one of the uh, biggest, I would say, investment, if not the biggest investment by FIBA on the TV production, as well as in the promotion of the event. Record sales in merchandising, record attendances, uh, fantastic atmosphere in the games. So it is, it is hard to challenge the, um, the premise that, uh, or the conclusion that certainly here we have been blessed to um, experience the best World Cup ever. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Andreas. David, your remarks as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andreas. Uh, those words mean a lot to us. Uh, we have spoken about those uh, intentions over many years, so thank you. Uh, I am the person in the room with the biggest smile uh, because this has been a difficult project. Uh, we've had uh, various affectations to our planning over the last four years, uh, particularly with reference to COVID, as Andreas referred to. Uh, my smile is um, due to us being able to achieve the maximum outcome, I think, that we could have in the areas that are relevant to us. Our job is to facilitate um, the tournament, uh, and I think in in three key areas we've uh, we've achieved our intended outcomes with respect to the facilitation. Uh, we've facilitated unprecedented numbers of spectators uh, and the potential for those people to enjoy quality competition at a quality venue. I need to give thanks to SOPA uh, for the way in which uh, the whole precinct has been presented in the last uh, 10 days, well, longer even. Um, 
uh, as well as our friends here at the Superdome. Uh, the fans have been amazing and our ability to facilitate their enjoyment of the game uh, has been an outstanding outcome uh, for which I thoroughly thank our LAC staff and our volunteers um, who have done a remarkable job in ensuring that large numbers of people are at the maximum level of their enjoyment. So to uh, the game day experience of our fans in the building and those watching uh, on the television. I think secondly, um, our facilitation, we also focused in this project on the players. Uh, I'm very pleased to hear extremely positive responses from the players as to their experience here. Uh, we have gone a long way uh, to ensuring uh, that the period leading into the tournament and the in-tournament period have been optimum for the players with respect to their gruelling schedules. These players are playing virtually every day uh, and they need to uh, ensure that um, the surroundings within which they're playing are at a premium and I think we've achieved that um, the third facilitation which also makes me happy is um, uh, as a basketball um, administrator in this country uh, is the legacy that we're going to leave uh, the sport of basketball, particularly uh, the, the female involvement, um, players, uh, score bench, referees, administrators. We've simultaneously conducted a number of forums and seminars uh, for all of those different categories over this period of time uh, and both the New South Wales Government and the Federal Government uh, need to be thanked heartily for the contributions that they have made to us being able to facilitate legacy on a long term in this country. Uh, one of the most significant um, wake-up calls I had in the early stages of this project was Lauren Jackson telling me that when we hosted the last Women's World Cup here in Sydney in 1994 that she was a spectator and she told me early in the project that when we were bidding that um, she saw that level of competition when she was a young girl here um, and uh, that motivated her uh, significantly to be the fantastic player that she is and, and the international name that she is. So we're hoping that um, many of our young female participants in the sport will see that player, will see that referee, will see those um, administrators who are involved in the game. Hopefully many of them were volunteers as well, so they've had hands-on. So. Our job was to facilitate, I think we've ticked those three boxes of uh, attendees, of players and of uh, legacy uh, to the best we possibly could. I couldn't have um, uh, given more thanks to the fantastic staff beneath Andreas uh, within the FIBA organisation. This is a joint venture. Us LOC are running the show on the ground. Uh, with respect to behind the doors, uh, but uh, we need to run concurrently with the FIBA staff who have been fantastic. The um, collaboration between our two teams has been of uh, the highest possible grade that we could have anticipated. They, the FIBA representatives, certainly uh, let us uh, facilitate uh, in an Australian way, which pleased me greatly. We had to explain some of the um, traditions here in Australia, but those traditions, once explained, were understood, respected and actioned wholeheartedly by the FIBA team. But um, I want to thank you, Andreas, and your team publicly for that. I have nothing else to say other than uh, thanking you all here as the media as well for the wonderful way that you've portrayed this event as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for sharing your thoughts. We are all ready to open the floor to media. We'll take one question in front, please, first. Uh, Doug Feinberg, the Associated Press. The, the numbers you mentioned were great, obviously. I mean, I can't remember a game I've covered, like last night, where the fans were so engaged for both sides. It wasn't a one-sided crowd, and the atmosphere was great. And I have a two-part question. The first one is... Andreas, where do you see this game growing in the next four years before the next World Cup, since obviously Australia set a very high bar now for what a World Cup could be? 
The second half of the question is, the one complaint I've heard from the players is just the rest. I mean, I think half the teams had WNBA players on them. They just finished their seasons, and I think they're starting the other leagues soon enough. Is there anything you guys can do to maybe change the time or do something to make this so they're not flying around the world right after finishing a season and trying to put on the best show they can possibly? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, in terms of, of growth of, of the game, um, I, I think you, it, it was short-term uh, objective to deliver the level that we delivered here. In the medium term, we want to have the same level or even higher of competitiveness with 16 teams, which we didn't have in the past. And we discussed this morning, we had a, a breakfast uh, gathering of, of the central board and we feel very confident about this decision to go back to 16 teams because if you see how many quality teams were not here, I believe we're easily uh, at a very good tournament of 16 teams. Now, looking at the top five, we have four continents here in, in Sydney. So the growth has to come in every continent. Um, I cannot hide from you that looking at the um, wider FIBA family and its investments in women's basketball, we have to look at the Continental Cups. We have approximately 45 teams playing next summer uh, or winter for the Southern Hemisphere uh, in 2023. And this is where we need to really start going to the next, to the next level. We have a very competitive uh, Eurobasket. I believe we will have one or two teams more emerging from Asia. There is a lot of work being done in the Americas. You saw the difference that Puerto Rico managed to make compared to Olympics or even to as recently as the February qualifying tournament. Uh, Brazil and Argentina are, are making big efforts in that respect. We saw a Canada stronger than, uh, I would say, all recent uh, tournaments. Um, in Africa, the champion is not here, a team that had excellent results in, in February. So I believe one of the markers we have on the way to 2026 is the two continentals of 23 and 25. The road to Paris is built around those FIBA competitions. And I do believe that the tournaments that we have mid-season give an opportunity for the teams to gather and really improve also the team spirit. We saw it in the men's national team competitions earlier this year. Um, the better teams you manage to present in the competitions, the higher the level of, of competitiveness in, in the tournaments. On the calendar side, um, we can control what we can control. And I can tell you in 26, we will not play three days in a row. That will not happen again. This is not something we want to see being repeated. It is too heavy on the players. We receive their feedback and we have to act. And I can commit on this today. When it comes to uh, aligning with other competitions, of course there is, there is work to do. As you know, the NBA is represented on, on the executive committee of FIBA through the deputy commissioner of the NBA. We will discuss this, these matters as well. We have had meetings here with a number of, of players who wanted to give us feedback. Of course, this is not something that uh, is immediately publishable. I, I think it is our job to receive feedback from the players and then act accordingly. We have a very strong uh, FIBA EuroLeague women starting in a few weeks. Um, the national leagues are doing uh, tremendous work with, with the federations both in, in a, and outside Europe. And then when the, the summer league comes, the, the WNBA obligations for the players start, we believe there are solutions that make uh, this schedule compatible. What is important for us is that the players are able to choose and they are able to play if they want in all the competitions or to select where they want to play. We don't want to be putting the players into the situation that they are forced directly or indirectly to choose between one club in one league or another club in another league. The national team aspect is different. The World Cup is turning next year 70 years old, the Women's World Cup. Has been there much before virtually every women's league in the world. And it is the top FIBA competition. So the calendar starts with the World Cup. The World Cup in 26 will again be in September. And we will be working, of course, with our stakeholders to find the best possible solutions for the players.
Thank you very much, Andreas. Next question. Hi, Thomas Bergeron. Uh, a question for uh, David Reed, please. Uh, you mentioned her. She's playing her last game with the national team. She announced it today. What was the impact of Lauren Jackson coming back to the national team on, on your event, and how would you evaluate it? The um, involvement of Lauren as a player in the event, um, I think, is your question. Um, is something that I'll come back to in a moment. I think it's important to understand Lauren's involvement um, as an administrator as well. She um, has been a significant uh, influence on this event. I've certainly, as I explained earlier, taken counsel from Lauren on a number of different aspects when framing up the way we're going to run the event. Um, so I think uh, it's important to acknowledge that uh, Lauren had a significant role in this, in this project long before she announced that she was um, she was going to try and play in the event. Um, I think the, the effect of Lauren's involvement as a player, um, uh, which is more in the public eye, um, has certainly had a profound effect um, uh, on the culture of the team. I think that um, there was um, uh, a, um, a positive influence from Lauren in that regard. Um, because of her longevity in being an Opal. Um, we've had this week a reunion of all old Opals and it was clear, Lauren spoke at that event, um, it was clear that um, uh, Lauren is at the core of that culture. I think that's, um, that, that's an effect, to answer your question. The other effect, obviously, was the focus of the attention on the event. Um, our ticket sales spiked. Um, uh, in two regards. One, when Lauren announced that she was thinking of playing, um, and secondly, when she was ultimately chosen in the final team. Both of those events um, in the subsequent days spiked our sales by approximately 125% uh, of what it was before. Um, so Lauren's involvement has been significant on a number of levels, though, not merely on the court. Thank you. One more question in the back. Yeah. Hi, um, this one's for Andres, uh, TK here. Um, there was obviously a good following in the venue, but also a large appetite on digital as well. As we can see, the many posts from uh, media, from fans throughout the entire competition. Can you say a bit about how this <coughs> displays the appetite for, for fans for women's basketball? How do you view that? Thank you. Um, I believe there are two elements here. One is the, the quality of the feed, of the broadcasting production that uh, I, I believe uh, FIBA Media has, has done an excellent job here together with our partners ESPN um, and the level of investment that went by us and our partners into the presentation of the games has been for Women's World Cup unprecedented. So we have the uh, core element, which is fantastic images. The second aspect, and I think we need to be grateful to our athletes, they have been extremely collaborative and they have embraced themselves, their national federations, through their own social media channels and their um, engagement in the process, um, the promotional efforts of FIBA. Um, we have uh, put into the, this event some novelties in how we would showcase um, our protagonists, the stars of the game, with special features, because we want to create more superstars for women's basketball, not only because it is good for the growth of the game at the elite level, but also, as we heard three days ago, when we had the Global Forum of Women in Leadership, you have to see it in order to be it. We want to inspire the next generation of athletes. So um, I'm very happy to, to report we've uh, had already more than 270 million impressions. This is close to 180% increase from the last uh, World Cup, and three times the video views, 
more than 180 million video views. And these are numbers from last night, without counting the finals. Um, our our web website traffic has been always the highest ever for a, for a Women's World Cup. So we are very happy to see that the audience really shows a great appetite. And I would like to emphasize the global audience. It is not an audience just in specific pockets or geographically speaking, specific regions of the world. Um, therefore, uh, this is uh, for us a tremendous encouragement. And I cannot here but uh, say a big thank you to our partners. Uh, I believe the, um, the first ever dedicated for women's basketball partnership with, uh, uh, with Google um, has had a big impact on how um, our game has been promoted in the US but also worldwide. But uh, I cannot here uh, omit the great efforts undertaken by Molten, by TCL, and, uh, and the rest of our, of our partners in this process of trying to really push the agenda. As I said a few days ago, it's easier to put something on the agenda than push uh, the agenda on, on a topic. So um, we, we believe this, this World Cup really opens a, a new era for women's basketball worldwide. And we're sure our national federation, our leagues, and our players will make the most out of it. Thank you, Andreas. We have one question online in the Zoom chat. Um, it's sort of for both. There were more female referees and more female coaches in this Women's World Cup. How does that make you feel about the progression of women's basketball in Australia for you, David, and um, Andreas for FIBA globally? Well, I think, as I said before, the... the um, uh, the saying that Andreas said, you, 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 know, you need to see it to be it in the future is, is relevant to the involvement of women uh, at the levels you described, refereeing, score bench, uh, officiating, administrating. Uh, I think that is going to be the ultimate legacy f uh, for this uh, event within basketball in Australia. We have a number of... Um, uh, initiatives uh, both at the New South Wales level and also at the uh, Australian level to piggyback on that focus and that um, momentum um, that is uh, generated by this event and um, uh, we, we see that as being enormously positive in the in the short and long term. Um, as I said we are um, happy about these figures they are clear indicators of, of progress, but I have to say, uh, we cannot yet say we're satisfied. We will be satisfied when we have these figures in the Men's World Cup, when we have half of the referees uh, women in the Men's World Cup and half of the coaches women in the Men's World Cup. This, uh, these are the, uh, uh, the barriers we need to, uh, to really see coming down in our sport. Uh, and, and we had this discussion three days ago in the forum uh, I think what this tournament proves is that um, you, we have two, two women coaching, head coaching the final tonight. Um, you can and you should trust uh, women coaches. We had um, two women head coaches in, in our continentals of men, one in, in Africa, uh, Kenya team, and one in Americas, the Virgin Islands team. But these are very small figures. I think this is now the time for the federations and the clubs in the men's game to start uh, putting their trust in, in women's coaches because there are some great talents and some great leaders there. As it comes to refereeing, I think um, we already have a 40% increase in the referees that can officiate any type of competition. Um, yes, we had some firsts last year, first women officiating a, um, a men's game in, in the Olympics, but sometimes I even hesitate to, to note these, these uh, achievements publicly because these should be uh, achievements of 10, 15 or 20 years ago. So um, I do believe there is a long way to go. 
Thank you very much. This will conclude the press conference. Thank you very much, Andreas and David, for your time and for sharing these insights with us. Uh, enjoy the third place game and the final. Um, we will see uh, you later for the post-game press conference. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you.